You done heard a thousand times before that there's no history of the Israelites ever being in Egypt, right? What if I told you that I found the city of the Hebrews in Egypt, hidden in plain sight? And I'm going to bring it out at the Passover. This Passover 2016. I'm going to drop the day for UPK. We're having um, a lecture about the Bible is not a white man's book. So why? Because a lot of us, we believe that, you know, the so-called Bible is written by um, a white man. It's basically for him. But we're going to go and we're going to also present facts showing you that the Bible is not um, a white man's book. So first off, it'll be myself. Then it'll be Officer Dom Gabar. Then it'll be Officer Karafia. So, what I'll be doing is I'll be going to the history of the Bible and about the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Constantinople as well, showing you that you know there was no agenda and that you know the Bible is not the plan of the so-called white man, as like they say every time. So, um, I'm going. I'm going to go into that. Just going to work on the. Um, uh, um, on this first one too but yeah that is what we're going to be going into within this lecture that we have so if you can um, I'll start with mine and um, the history of the Bible and also about the councils as well if, uh, if you can go to the uh, next slide all right so now today we're going to be going into the Council of Nicaea and it has the dates and the Council of Constantinople also um, as well. Now, some people believe that Constantine, he was a so-called white man, but now if you buy books, one called the Russian uh, icons, these are actually depictions of Constantine and he was not actually white. And even also the people that he, that he had the council with as well, as you can see, all of them have darker skin uh, on them which is to the picture on my left and the one on my right as well so now why are we going into this because some people say and some people believe that Constantine at his councils changed wrote and tampered with the Bible so we're gonna one two yes yeah, so now we're gonna go into that with Constantine, he did not write the Bible, he did not tamper with the Bible, nor he did, sorry, nor did he do anything to make it suit his agenda at that time also um, as well. If you can go to the uh, next slide. So now, first off, what is a Bible? Because you know, a lot of people, they like to use words, but they don't know the definition of these words. So now, the origin and the history for the word Bible is, so now, it's a Anglo-Latin word. It can, it, it, it can also be found in Old French as well, the Bible. So now, it means a large book from the medieval and late Latin Biblia. And it is interpreted as a feminine in phrase Biblia, meaning a holy book, a translation of Greek to Biblia, which means the holy book. So now that word, it don't just always mean for the Bible that we read. So for example, if anyone has a book and they would believe that that would be a holy book, then they could also use the term Bible also uh, as well. So that is just the definition of that word, when it, if you can go to the uh, next slide. So now, who wrote the Bible? Because we know that no book has ever flew out the sky. 
Because you know, many people say, well, um, a man wrote that book, and it's common sense that man wrote the book, just like any book that you read, of course a man wrote that book. So now, the Bible, it was written by a man, just like, just like any other book that you would see also as well. So uh, if a reader can get me Psalms 68 and verse 11. Psalm 68 and 11. The Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those that published it. There, so now the saying, the Lord gave the word. So the words came from the Most High. But great was the company of those that published it. So of course, it was men that wrote it down. It was men that, you know what I mean, obviously had to physically write this book. So now if you can go to the, uh, well actually, one second. Um, so if you can just go um, back one time. All right, so now men wrote the Bible just like any other book. But now with these men, they was given the word by God. So now how do we know by the prophecies found in the book? If you can go to the uh, next slide. So now, what is the definition of the word prophecy? It's a noun, plural, prophecies. So now, what does it mean? It means the foretelling or the prediction of what is to come. So if I'm gonna say to someone, if you walk and then a car is going to run you down, I'm not saying I want that to happen to somebody, of course, but you know what I mean? That would be me prophesying unto somebody um, another definition something that is declared by a prophet especially a divinely inspired prediction instruction or exhortation so now to exhort is to raise someone up so now you're telling them something good um, another one a divinely inspired utterance or a revelation oracles prophecies so now that is just showing you the, the definition of that word you can go to the uh, next slide so now um, the next part I'm going into is the accuracy of the prophecies found within the Bible so that goes arguably the most compelling evidences demonstrating that the Bible is the word of God is its unswerving ability to accurately predict the future uh, events often in many details specific prophecies are conspicuously present from the 26 other religious books so of course now there are obviously many other religious books but one thing what we know is that with the bible it has many detailed prophecies which with these 26 other religious books they do not have for example the Egyptian book of the dead or like obviously some um, other ones too that claim to be scripture including the Quran and the um, book of the um, Hindus and the Buddhist writings so now with all of these other books the prophecies a as pinpoint like the ones that you would find within the Bible this in itself should be a major eye opener to the honest skeptic God through the prophet Isaiah once challenged the pagan idolaters of that time to tell us what the future holds so we may know that they are God's so if someone can get me Isaiah chapter 41 and you can start from verse 23 so now this is going to show you that if you know if, if a book is inspired by God and um, also too before I get into anything else I'd like to you know big up those who I mean I'd like to big up those who um, attended big up to big up to Rasai as well and also Naka Badwa for you know what I mean also um, at the, also at attending the event and you know what I mean um, that's it all right um, someone's car window is down obviously I'm sure you don't want no one to get into your car so um, if everyone can just check their cars too to you know make sure their windows are winded up no one near 
Okay then, but yeah, definitely. So, um, is someone can get me Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 23. Isaiah 41 and 23 show the things that are to come hereafter. So now the prophet Isaiah, he was sh he was saying, show the things that are to come here um, uh, after we done. That we may know that ye are God. There, so now, if you can show the things that are that are going to come, that's how you're gonna know if basically that God is real or it's not. Now, with these 26 other religious books, they can't do any of that. Now, in the Bible, time and time again, that's what you will find showing that the showing you that the real God and like um, His word is found within this book. Um, is there um, any more on that? Yeah. Do good or do evil that we may be dismayed. All right, um, with that part, it's going into something else, but and um, that was the point out of that verse. So now, the Bible contains over 2,000 prophecies that have been for uh, ill, many with very specific details. One must ask himself why he would remain skeptical in the light of the incontrovertible evidences so now no other religious book can basically hold claim to 2000 prophecies that have came to pass it would seem that if someone was honestly say eking the truth it would certainly be worthwhile effort to at least investigate a handful of these prophecies so now this shows you that Basically, the right God is found in this Bible. You can go to the uh, next slide. So now, in the Bible, of course there's lots, but this is just a main one. So now, one that we're going to go into is in the book of Daniel. Now, with this picture here, this is what the prophet, Dan this is what the prophet Daniel had seen. Now, where now if you look up at the top right this is the babylonian kingdom down here is the persian and the greece and then it's the rome now in his time he had prophesied that these four kingdoms would basically rule now have in mind he said this while he was in the babylonian kingdom which shows you that the word that he got was divinely inspired by God because nobody can tell who is going to rule next. Now, like now, the one I'm right is exactly just the same one, showing you that whenever people read the book of Daniel, they do understand what it is um, uh, on about. So now, if you can go to the uh, next slide. So now, who wrote the book of Daniel? The book of Daniel is one of the most criticized books of the bible why because he spoke of the four biggest kingdoms that we have ever seen so some people try to debate this book and say that it was not written at that time so now daniel is as the established author throughout the contents of the book of daniel daniel is told in daniel the 12th chapter and the fourth verse seal the book until the end of time and in verse 9 we read go your way Daniel so now we know that he read this book and this book was also talking about him Jesus or as we call in the Hebrew Yahweh Shai also attributes the book of Daniel as or as an um, authorship to to Daniel and these are the scriptures that you can find which also refers to it as it was Daniel that wrote the book. So now in the third century, a pagan named Porthuri, sorry for the pronunciation, questioned the sixth century BC dating the authorship of the, the sorry, dating the authorship of Daniel Jerome, the translator of the Vulgate, replied to his charges in his commentary on, the, on Daniel. And um, this man's name, 
pull through it was followed by critics in the 17th century who claimed Daniel was written in the Maccabean period which is 166 BC by the Maccabean Jews because of Daniel's precise historical accuracy so now with this man he was saying well the book of Daniel it can't be written in his time because the things that he said would come to pass which is that firstly I mean which is that first the first the Persians would rule then the Greeks and then also the Romans as well so with this man he said this can't be correct that this book was written in um, his time so now the dating of the book of Daniel varies from the 6th to the 2nd century BC liberal critics who attribute the authorship to the Maccabean 166 BC give the book of Daniel a late date the purpose of the late date is denial of the super uh, actual aspects of the book so a lot of them they would date the book to the second century because they don't believe in God so by them reading this book they go well we don't believe that that book can be written in that time because no one can predict that the Greeks they would rule and then also the Romans as well conservative Christians and Jews who accept who accepts the super not the super na, uh, actual aspects of scripture have no problem dating the book of Daniel from 605 to 536 right from to 536 BC you can go to the uh, next you can go to the uh, next page all right so now that's uh, so if you could just rotate the page just a little bit to the right so I can read so now what was these records before the Bible they were ancient scrolls now as you can see on my right this is what you would call the Dead Sea scrolls so now before a Bible was ever read this is what it was before so now the Dead Sea scrolls it was created 408 BC to 318 CE discovered in 1946 and it was all found within 1956 so this is just a little bit of what the Dead Sea Scrolls is about so the Dead Sea Scrolls in a sense of the Quanrum Caves Scrolls are a collection of some 981 different texts discovered between 1946 and 1956 in 11 caves in the immediate vicinity of the ancient uh, settlements at Kibritz Kwanran in the West Bank so now this is where they found all of these ancient all these ancient scrolls the consensus is that the Kwanren cave scrolls date from at least three centuries BCE and the first century CE so now this is just roughly where basically they was dated back to if you can go to the next slide so now this is also another record that you can find this is called the Murops ID Murestorian fragment now this is where you find the books of Matthew Mark Luke John or the New Testament writings all right if you can read that for me the Muratorian fragment is the oldest known list of New Testament books it was discovered by Ludovico Antonio Muratori in a manuscript in the Abrosian library in Milan and published by him in 1740 right so this is where you find Luke, Mark, John and all those um, uh, other books too so now even though it was found at uh, that time you know what I mean now what we're gonna do we're going to go into who wrote these books because some people say well how can you show that John wrote John Mark wrote Mark 
which we're going to get into also as well. Uh, next slide. All right, so now with these books, as um, with these books, we're going to show you that these books were actually written by them. If you can go to the uh, next slide. I don't know if you need a book or I can read that screen. Um, okay. So now, if you can read that. The book of Matthew, there is good historical tradition that Matthew actually wrote gospel material. Mm -hmm. This comes from Papias of Herolopis, as quoted by the church historian Esobius. All right, so now, these are those that was around at him that time as well and they can confirm that it was him that did actually write this mm -hmm. it was him that did actually write mm -hmm. this you know what I mean it wasn't that you know someone writ it and they're pretending that it was him uh, read on Matthew wrote down the logia in Hebrew in the Hebrew language and everyone translated them as best he could in and church history all right so now that's where you can find that from if you can read the next um, uh, part. The Logia were a collection of our Lord's sayings. Then it is possible that Matthew expanded these into a Greek gospel. It is a significant fact that the so-called Q material, which Matthew's Logia is most associated, shows signs of being translation from Aramaic. Yeah, so now, even though now we read it and it's written in Greek, Originally, the original one was in the so-called Aramaic, which is basically the ancient Hebrew. So now, it was translated from that. If you can read the next part with the um, uh, red lines on the exact same one. Dr. G. E. Ladd well remarks, if Matthew wrote a first edition of his gospel in Aramaic for the Jewish Christian community in Antioch, and Mark wrote a gospel in Rome embodying the Petrine tradition, it is entirely credible that then Matthew later produced a second edition, Greek. He made free use of the Petrian Gospel, mm -hmm. thereby adding his own testimony to his authority and proving that the uh, apostolic witness to Christ was not divided. There, so he first read one, and then when they read their books, he also said he would basically rewrite his and then. That's the one that we. That's the one that we we read right um, uh, now. You can read just the um, other part. Um, Antioch is the most likely place of origin. Early in the second century, Ignatius of the city refers to Matthew as the gospel. Also, the Gentile Jewish character of Antioch Church accords well with the content of the book. All right, there. So now, even they knew that he read this. So. It wasn't, you know, written by some one else. This is his personal account, and that book was also written by him. If you can go to the uh, next slide. If, if, if you can read that, or do you need it? The book of Mark, authorship. The second gospel was written by Mark and presents the preaching of Peter. Papias is quoted by Ephesus as saying, and John, is the presbyter also said this mark being the interpreter of peter whatsoever he recorded he wrote great accuracy there so now even they know that it was written by him so when you open up the book the book of mark is written by him and then also they even give you some background into what happened and also why they wrote these books also as well, uh, read on. He was in company with Peter who gave him such instruction as was necessary, but not to give history of our Lord's discourses. All right, now that's really key because many scholars they always say that, why is it that in his, it's a very short book. Like if you read John and, and, and like the um, uh, rest of them, it has a lot more to say while as basically with his, it's really just direct. So now that is explaining why so he didn't really talk with him as much about what Christ had actually spoken with them. We done. 
this suggests that Mark has given us a summary of the message of Peter. Yeah, so with the book of Mark, it's really just basically a quick breakdown of what he got from Peter. Read on. Justin Martyr quotes Mark 3.17 as from Peter's memoirs. Irenaeus writes that after the departure of Peter and Paul from Rome, Mark, the disciple, the interpreter of Peter, also transmitted to us in writing that what had been preached by Peter. There, so now, this lets you understand that these books was actually written by them. So now no one doesn't have to say, well, how do I know if what I'm um, reading is actually from their um, uh, account? So now this is actually historical facts showing you that these men did write these books. Um, read on. Most scholars hold that departure means death. Clements of Alexandria, however, affirms that the gospel was written during Peter's lifetime. Mm -hmm. Here is his statement. When Peter had proclaimed that the word publicly at Rome and declared the gospel under the influence of the Spirit, as there was a great number present, they requested Mark to reduce these things to writing. And, and then, also, also now, with um, uh, that part, it's just, it's just going into why he wrote um, that down. So um, that's basically it on like, that book. If we, if we can go to the next book, um, if you can read that. So now this is going into Luke's book about, you know, if um, he writ it or, you know, was it written by someone else? Read on. I mean, read, sir. The book of Luke, authenticity. The authenticity of the third gospel has not been successfully challenged. References are frequent in the second century. Justin, uh, Polycarp, Papias, Hagastapos. It right. is, it oh. is. Oh, sorry. So now, we like all of that there. Those are scholars at um, uh, that time. So now, they know that it was actually Luke who um, read that book. So if you want, you can also look them up as well. And even they can also show you that that book was, it, it was written by him. Um, you can go to the uh, next part. It is probable. It is probable that Clement alludes to it, AD 95. It is mentioned as the work of Luke by Mauritian, fragment AD 170 by Irenaeus. All right, so now, that, so now that was the record that I was on about before when you saw the writing and also when it was found as well. So now the book of Luke, everyone knew at the time that it was written by him and there's also fragments of the book too, uh, read on. Such testimony continues to the third century. Clement of Alexandria, Cerulean, Oregon, such a mass of evidence is quite decisive. There, so it's not a debate to find out that if he read his book or not, you can read the other um, uh, highlight part. The period of Paul's imprisonment in Caesarea saw Luke in Palestine, and this period, conjecturally, AD 58 to 59, would presumably give abundant opportunity for the research which is evident in the record. Luke's Gospel is thus the latest of the Synoptic Gospels. There, so now, so now with the Sagalas, they can also give you a time frame as well. So now, because basically Paul was um, uh, locked up, it also gave him time to speak with, it gave him time to speak with him and also to get everything together to write the book. You can read the um, next page. Luke, according to the oldest extant list of the New Testament writings, known from the name of it discovered as the Muratation Fragment and dated from the latter half of the second century. Luke was the writer of the third gospel as the, as the Acts of the Apostles. There, so he read his book and the book of, um, uh, and the book of um, uh, Acts as well. So, you know, he is known for, for writing those books. Um, you can read the other part. More certain evidence supports 
other conjectures and traditions that he knew Mary is fairly clear from the early chapters of the gospel and right. the period. All right, so now with that part, some people say, well, how did he know about Christ being born? That That is because he knew he, that is because he knew Jesus, he knew Jesus Christ is a um, mom. So now that's why in his book, he was able to also write those things down as well. Uh, read on. Our acquaintance may have been during Paul's <coughs> incarceration at Caesarea. Uh, Eusebius and Jerome <coughs> say that Luke was a Syrian of Antioch and he does seem to have close knowledge of the Antiochian church. And there and also, the, and also those men there, they was um, around him at um, uh, that time. And they can also affirm that he did um, uh, exist because you know some people say that it's a myth and that these men wasn't really um, alive. But of course, these are men that was um, around him at um, uh, that time too. You can go to the next slide. So now this is the book of John. So now this is also going to show you that with John, he also read his book too. Book of John, tradition holds the Apostle John to be thus author and that the date and place and authorship was sometime toward the close of the first century AD. Mm -hmm. Asia Minor, this tradition can be traced back to um, Eusebius, the church historian, at the beginning of the fourth century. All right, there so now, he can also affirm that he read the book and also where he read the book as well, uh, read on. Theophilus, who flourished about AD, 170 to 180, the major witness besides East of us are Oregon, Clement of Alexandria, the writer of the Merotian canon of Theophilus, Irenaeus, one of the earliest of these witnesses, was a disciple of the Polycarp, who, was, who in turn had been a disciple of the Apostle John. All right, there's now the people that was around him, they can also affirm that he um, uh, read that. So I mean, we've gone through that. You can go through the uh, next slide. All right, so now let's get back to Constantine. Now, as you can see, if you buy a book called The Russian uh, Icons, you know, there's lots of paintings of him. And he was also a so-called black man um, as well. If you go to the uh, next slide. So now, Many people that say that Constantine wrote the book or he tampered with the book to suit his um, agenda. You know what I mean? A lot of them don't even know who he was or where he was born or anything. So with this, this is just like a brief history on the man. So we wouldn't need to read all of this, but if you can just read the first, like, where to? If you can read just the first paragraph. Constantine the Great was a Roman emperor from 306 to 337 AD. Constantine was the son of Flavius Valerius Constantius, a Roman army officer, and his consort Helena. His father became Caesar and deputy emperor in the West in 293 AD. All right, there. So I mean, we'd like him um, all of that. We wouldn't need to really go into all that, but that's just a little bit on the background of Emperor Constantine. Uh, next slide. So now, some people say that, well, Constantine, he was a devout Christian, but we're gonna show you that he was not. So now, if you can just read um, that part there. In February 313, Constantine met with Licinius in Milan, where they developed the Edict of Milan. The Edict stated that Christians should be allowed to follow the faith without oppression. All right, so now some people, they would read that part there and go, look, he was supporting Christianity, but if you um, read the rest, it's going to explain um, itself. Read on. This removes penalties for professing Christianity under which many had been martyred mm -hmm. previously and returned confiscated church property. The edict protected from religious persecution, not only Christian, but all religions. Yeah, there, so it wasn't only just for 
Christians, it was for all religions. So no matter what someone believed in, you know what I mean? It was for basically all of them, uh, read on. Allowing anyone to worship whichever deity they chose. There, so he did not just help Christians, he helps anybody. So whether you had any specific belief, that rule applied for them. Uh, next slide. All right, if you can just read that, that's quite a bit. However, Constantine certainly did not patronize Christianity alone. After gaining victory in battle of the Milvian Bridge, a triumphal arc, the Ark of Constantine was built to celebrate the triumph. The Ark was decorated with images of the goddess Victoria. So then, now, so now, when he won, he didn't put any... So he didn't put up anything that represented Christianity. He put up a pagan god. We done. At the time of his dedication, sacrifices to gods like Apollo, Diana, Hercules were made, absent from the ark, like the depictions of Christian symbolism. There, so for some people that say he was a devout Christian and that you know what I mean he was on them, uh, their side. History shows you that um, he was not, but uh, read on. However, as the Ark was commissioned by the Senate, the absence of Christian symbols may reflect the role of the Curia at, this, at the time as a pagan redoubt. There, so that also lets you know that he was not a devout Christian. You know what I mean? Even though he said, you know, he would follow their beliefs, when he won, he was obviously following so-called pagan gods. Uh, next slide. All right, so now this is a book you can buy. It's called The History of the Council of Nicaea, written by Dean Dudley. Um, if you can read from there, or do you need a book? All right, if you can read that. This was the first major council in Christendom taking place in the year AD 325, the major controlling force behind the convention was the Roman Emperor Constantine. Arena. Constantine came to power in ruthless fashion, one of six sovereigns of the Roman Empire in the year AD 308. They had been collectively appointed in 305. Only Constantine survived beyond the next decade and only one of the other sovereigns died a natural death. Constantine seemed to be involved in the death of each of the others and in doing so was thrust into the side of Christianity. All right, there, so now, with like that time, he was in basically um, uh, a war with everyone round uh, about him. So now, he was wise enough to know that if he got on the side of Christianity, he would, he would have them on um, uh, his side so now really, that's what it was about, if you can read on. The first opponent he attacked was Maxentius, who had imprisoned and banished the Christian minister at Rome after Constantine triumphed. He recalled and released the ministers fighting for Christians. Cause gave him a reckon to kill off his rivals. There, so with that, it was only an um, excuse so that anyone who was against him, he could win. So. He did not convert to Christianity because he believed. It was because at that time, you know what I mean, he wanted to win. So he saw it as, well, if I get with them, then basically I've got more support. Uh, read on. It became politically expedient for him to side with Christianity during this early and ruthless power struggle and murderous plots were in central theme. All right, there, so that is the whole reason why he converted to what we call Christianity. Uh, next slide. All right, so now this is about the Council of Nicaea because some people say, you know what I mean, this is where he rewrote the book or he tampered <coughs> with the book, but a lot of them don't even know what the council was even actually about. So if you can read them um, um, at the top. The Aryan question regarding the relationship between God the Father and the Son. All right, so now this is what the council was about because there was a there was another doctrine going around that with Christ, 
he wasn't so divine as you know some Christians actually believe and read not only in his incarnate form as Jesus but also in his nature before the creation of the world mm -hmm. i.e. are the Father and the Son one in divine purpose only or also one in being and therein this is where this whole belief comes from that you know um, with Christ and God they're one so now basically you had some people that believed that and you had some people that also did not ask them at that time if you can read um, the other part to the day of celebration of Pascha, Easter all right there so now you had Jews we would celebrate the Passover and then the pagans they would celebrate Easter so now that was also a debate so now he saw these things going on and you know what I mean like, and he wanted to basically make him come onto one under Sedanin at um, uh, that time and with number three and four that's going into something else but the main part of the council was about one um, and also about the Passover as well you can go to the next slide so if you, if you want to read that for me arguments of Iranianism according to the surviving accounts the presbyter Arius argued for the supremacy of God the Father there so this is why the council happened because he was saying that he doesn't believe that Christ and God um, they are the um, exact same uh, read and maintain that the Son of God was created as an act of the Father's will there so now he was saying well if God made him then of course they can't be one so he was questioning that which basically at that time that was a strong belief that they had read and therefore that the son was a creature made by God read begotten directly of the infinite eternal God all right so now he was saying well if he made him then how can he be him which makes common sense uh, read Arius' argument was that the son was God's very first production before all ages the position being that the son had a beginning and that only the father has no beginning their answer now because he said that everyone was basically upset and that's why this council took place a uh, read on and Arius argued that everything else was created through the Son. Thus said Arius, only the Son was directly created and begotten of God. And therefore, there was a time that he had no existence. All right, so now, because he said that, everyone that, you know, followed Christianity as said in that time, they were basically vexed with him. So now, this is why the council took place. And if you go to the uh, next slide, you can read that. Arguments against Arianism, the opposing view stem from the idea that beginning, the Son is itself in the nature of the Father, which is eternal. Thus the Father was always a Father, and both Father and Son existed always together, eternally, co-equally, and consubstantially. The contra Arian argument thus stated that the Logos was eternal begotten, therefore was no beginning. Those in opposition to Arius believes that the following, the Arian view destroyed the unity of the Godhead. All right, so now with them, they were saying, if they allow him to have this belief, it's like you're trying to destroy the unity of the Godhead. So now that's why this council happened because they were like, we can't have this man going around with this belief now this had nothing to do with tampering with with the book or you know rewriting um, anything within the book uh, read on and made the son unequal to the father they insisted that such a view was in contravention of such scriptures as I and the father are one and the word was God as such verses were interpreted, they declared, as did Athanasius, that the Son had no beginning, but had an eternal. Sorry, do, 
derivation from the Father and therefore was co-eternal with him and equal to God in all aspects, creed. Yes, now, with him, he obviously didn't agree with that, but with like everyone else, they use scripture like, I and um, the Father are one. And then basically, in that council, he did in that council, he did not win. And at the bottom it goes, the council of Nicaea. And basically, if you could see that picture there, his depicted being on the ground, meaning that he did not win at that council. So now that's what the council of Nicaea was really all about. You can go to the next slide. So now the result of the debate, so the council declared that the son was the true God, co-eternal and begotten from the same. Um, and basically now that's going into with his belief, he basically got shut down because they wasn't going to have him walking around saying anything like that. You can read um, that part there. Was this fair? Have in mind, Constantine is a pagan and anyone who opposed his order was took out of the council and banished to islands. And with that part, you also find it in the book of the history of the council of Nicaea. You can just read that part there for me. This was serious business for Constantine. He gathered the bishops from around the entire empire and brought them to Nicaea. Those who opposed Constantine's man mandate were pulled from the proceedings and banished to remote islands. The council then moved ahead and everything went fine. There, so now, have in mind, he was a pagan as well. And you know, they believe in like them things, so that's why with this man, when it was voted that, you know what I mean, he's wrong, he just went along with that because he would also get banished off as well. Uh, next slide. All right, so now, this is going into the council of Constantinople. So now, what happened was, even though he was shown that um, he was wrong, according to them, the doctrine was still going on. You can read that for me. The council of Nicaea in 325 had not ended the Arian controversy, which he had been called to clarify. Arius and his sympathizers, Easterbus, and Nicodemia were admitted back into the church after austerity accepting the Nicene Creed. All right, so now with that creed, it was the belief that they had. So if you did not believe in the same things as them, then you couldn't join the Nicene Creed at that time. So now with them, once they dropped that belief that, you know, like it was um, the Most High that made Christ, then they was allowed back into the Nicene Creed. Uh, read on. So, um, uh, Athanius. Athanius, Bishop of Alexandria, the most vocal opponent of Arianism. So now, with that man there, he still carried the belief that, you know, it was the Most High that made him. So now, even though at the council, it was shown that, you know, they was wrong, some of them still carried on that same belief, read. Was ultimately exiled through the machinations of Eusebius of Nicodemia after the death of Constantine in 337 and the accession of the Arian leading son, Constantius II, opening discussion of replacing Nicene Creed itself began. All right, there's so now, once Constantine died, the person that came up next, he kind of shared those same beliefs as well. So it's now, that's why that whole belief, it was basically coming back at him uh, that time. And they was thinking of replacing the Nicene Creed and maybe thinking that that belief is right. Uh, read on. Up until about 360, theological debates mainly dealt with the divinity of the sun. There, so now, those debates came uh, back up like as in so like as in the past read the second person of the trinity however because the council of nicaea had not clarified the divinity of the holy spirit the third person of the trinity it became topic of debate mm -hmm. the macedonians denied the divinity of the holy spirit this was also known 
as that's a long word pneumonitism so now they was wondering well okay then if we believe that all of them are so divine then we know that it's God and it's Christ then who is it gonna be next so there was debates some people were saying that well they're not so divine so then now that word pneumonitism means that uh, it's fake it's a Greek word if you uh, research it um, you can read the, uh, the other part Nicene Christianity also had its defenders apart from Athanasius, the Cappadocian Fathers Trinitarian discourse was influential in the Council of Constantinople Apollinus the Lacedaemonian, another pro nicene theologian proves controversial there's now with those men that he just read they still had the belief that with um, uh, God and Christ they was divine and that um, they was one so when they had the council you had some that believed it and you had some that did not uh, next slide so now what was the result of this council uh, can you read that for me the result of the council the council condemned Arianism which began to die out with further condemnation at a council and Aquila by Ambrose of Milan in 381 with the discussion of Victorian doctrine new developed and well under agreement to orthodox and biblical understanding the focus of discussion changed to Christianity which would be the topic of the Council of Ephesus of 431 and the Council of Chaldon All right. 451 okay so now the result of the council was that that whole belief it finally got squashed out and they were saying we're not having this again so now as regarding the council of Constantinople this was the last time that that belief would basically ever be um, around is there a next slide so now many unlearned people speak of these councils and they say that they wrote the bible or they changed it when historically they were having councils on doctrinal disputes so really the council of Nicaea and the council of Constantinople that was what it was really all about all right and with that um, that's my part there on the history of the bible the council of Nicaea and the council of Constantinople and uh, next um, we have officer Don Gabar showing that the bible is not a white man's book when I days I work hard on the job